Fora TV. Idea Immersion. Visit us at www.fora.tv. Art itself, we learn, is to, be, is to be distinguished from craft. You're not likely to find a woven pomo basket displayed alongside an oil painting at the Museum of Modern Art. Then there's the matter of trained versus untrained art making. Talented or not, in many specialists' eyes, if you have a degree in art, you have a greater claim to attention than someone who made it up from scratch. Until recently, much serious thought was expended on the question of high versus low art works made for unabashedly commercial purposes were considered somehow beneath those made ostensibly for other nobler functions. So what? Are these questions of any consequence to those outside the field of art? Or are they academic matters left to be best left to be hashed out at the annual meetings of the College Art Association? I believe that the way we define art is indeed relevant to a broader public, not only because art is part of most of our daily lives, but also because the way we define art mirrors other profound social definitions. Specifically, I believe that what we see mirrored in the ways that the arts are defined in our society is a reflection of lingering vestiges of sexism, racism, and classism. For these are the terms that lie just beneath the surface of words like craft, untrained art, and outsider art. We've allowed the arts to become a kind of dumb show in which so-called values that would be considered discriminatory at best in everyday discourse take the stage to enact lingering myths of hierarchy. Creative works become surrogates with which time-worn dramas of inclusion and exclusion are performed. For this very reason, these categories and definitions should not go untested. There's more at stake than the success or failure of individual careers. The ways we define and categorize art say much about our society as a whole, about our willingness to accept difference, to welcome change, and to find joy in the present. And more important, it is as much a matter for the viewer as it is for the curator or art historian. Museums labor under tremendous institutional inertia. Change comes slowly when there is so much at stake. For the viewer, however, change can be instantaneous, as swift as, op as the opening of one's eyes. I've been lucky as a curator to have worked at institutions that welcome change and where my colleagues felt that there was more to be gained than lost in expanding the definition of art. I've been able to mix things up, combining materials normally kept apart, challenging conventional assumptions through how and what I presented. An especially eye-opening project was one I undertook with a college classmate, Lafcadio Cortese, with whom I traveled to Papua New Guinea to visit a tribe called the Maizen. The Maizen are known throughout Papua New Guinea for their remarkable tapa cloth paintings. Painting for the Maizen is a traditionally female role, and the vast majority of women spend a good portion of each day sitting around a fire painting with vegetable dyes on tapa, a cloth-like paper that is made by pounding the bark of the mulberry tree. And I'm going to pause for a moment to show you a tapa cloth painting. This is why it's better to go to a reading than actually read a book, because you get to see real things. Uh, this is a tapa cloth painting from the Maizen and you can see it's made of bark cloth, pounded bark, and then this one has only two dyes, uh, red and black, which is basically, they have one other color, yellow, that they use very uh, occasionally, but most of the top of cloths you'll see have these colors. One of the interesting things about this particular top of cloth is you'll notice it's divided into four sections, and uh, there's a certain kind of repetition, although it's vague. And the way that's done is really essential to the meaning of the work, which is not uh, sacred. It's, uh, and I'll get to that in an essay, but basically what they do is they start with a folded tapa cloth, and they will hold it on their lap and paint the first design like that, the first quadrant. Then they fold it over and repeat that design from memory on the second quadrant. Then they fold it over and repeat it a third time and then a fourth. So what you get in the end is a, an image of memory, uh, memory of, you know, of creativity seen over, over time. Um, and it's a kind of, a, I guess you could say, a, a, an art, a, an artistic game that they play, but one that I think is very profound and has really no corollary in Western art that I'm, that I'm aware of. Uh, I think it's a very subtle expression of the power of the imagination and the way that the mind uh, 
sort of expands and extends and changes organically over, over time through processes of memory. The Misen paintings are neither sacred nor conventional. Each time they sit down to make a picture, the Misen derive an image, as one painter told me, free from the imagination. Yet the Misen do not have a word that corresponds exactly to our word art. Instead, they have the term saruman, which means simply thinking and doing, making atop a painting that calls on the hand to respond to the free-flowing mind is Saruman. Making a canoe that requires only undeviating skill is not. At the time I visited the Mizen lands, Tapa painting was undergoing something of a renaissance. New styles were being explored, and an increasing number of men were joining the women around the pots of steaming dye to try their hands at painting. One reason for this renewed interest was the tribe's collective decision to use proceeds from the sale of their paintings to help fund alternatives to the sale of logging rights to their half million acres of virgin forested ancestral lands. Ultimately, I worked with the Misen to present two exhibitions of their paintings in the United States. These exhibitions in museum contexts called into question the boundaries between art and craft, between trained and untrained artistic practice, and because the tapa were made for commercial markets between so-called high and low art. Although their practice, strictly speaking, fell outside the boundaries of art as I was taught to define it, I found greater formal skill, greater imaginative refinement, and far greater social relevance in their work than in virtually any other visual material I have dealt with in the more than 100 exhibitions I have organized. What has made my work in the arts continually exciting and challenging, and I hope useful, is that I have avoided resting on a comfortable bed of knowledge and instead have followed my heart to richer, if more ambiguous and challenging territories. If, as Einstein noted, our world of definitions and propositions rests on shaky ground, this should hardly be cause for despair.